Hello, everybody, and welcome to the GW Institute for Korean Studies event featuring Ye Won Lee. We're really so delighted uh, that she's speaking here uh, for us today. Uh, my name is Richard Grinker, and I'm a professor of anthropology and international affairs at the George Washington University. And I've been involved with Korean studies at George Washington University since I arrived here in 1992. And my, how we, we have grown and uh, become such a, a robust uh, place for Korean studies. Um, it's remarkable to see uh, what's happened over all of these years. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce Ye Won Lee. She is currently an assistant research professor of international affairs and a postdoctoral fellow at the George Washington University Institute for Korean Studies. She received her PhD in sociology at UCLA in 2019 and previously held a 2019-20 Korea Foundation postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto. Her current book project entitled Precarious Workers in the Speculative City, The Untold Gentrification Story of Tenant Shopkeepers, Displacement and Resistance in Seoul, examines how tenant shopkeepers challenge financial speculation in Seoul's commercial real estate industry through protest and collective organizing. Dr. Lee's research on the resistance to commercial gentrification in Korea has appeared in critical sociology. The manuscripts emerging from her project have been well received winning prestigious awards, including the American Sociological Association's 2020 Labor and Labor Movement Section's Distinguished Contribution to Scholarship Graduate Student, uh, to scholarship graduate student Paper Award. Her title today of her talk, following which we'll have a Q&A, which you can uh, do through the chat or you can unmute and speak, is Fighting Evictions in the Speculative City, the Politics of Class and Solidarity for Tenant Shopkeepers in Seoul. Uh, so with a, a sort of virtual applause, let's um, please welcome uh, Dr. Yeowon Lee. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, let me share my screen now. Okay. Yes, so I am Yeowon Lee as introduced. It is a great honor to be speaking to you uh, today. And uh, today, uh, my presentation called Fighting Evictions in the Speculative City, the Politics of Class and Solidarity for Tenant Shopkeepers in Seoul. Uh, it, it comes out of my dissertation field work, my dissert dissertation project. So uh, I conducted uh, field work, ethnographic field work with uh, tenant shopkeepers who are organizing to defend their livelihoods uh, in Seoul, Korea. I conducted 15 months of field work. And what struck me uh, when I was in Korea was how vibrant this group of tenant shopkeepers were uh, in defending their livelihoods. And surprisingly to me was how they were able to make connections uh, with the so-called progressive social movement actors in Korea. And uh, I say this is surprising. I say surprising because there is a certain kind of class politics that we expect from shopkeepers. Uh, for example, uh, when you think about uh, uh, the United States, uh, the shopkeepers, the small entrepreneurs are the biggest donor base of uh, President Trump. So uh, that speaks loud in and of itself. So uh, let me share you a pic show you a picture. Sometimes I have a hard time. Okay, there we go. So this picture to me captures more or less uh, what we expect of the shopkeepers politics to be. So what you're seeing here is shopkeepers have gathered in the middle of all Seoul and they are coming together to express their voice that they are in, against raising the minimum wage, right? And they're saying that this move can kill all 
shopkeepers. However, on the ground, I also find a different type of class politics, especially among a certain subset of shopkeepers. So uh, tenant shopkeepers. Uh, in Korean, uh, 상가 세입자 or 임차 상인. So these are people who rent the space that they run their business, run their shops. And uh, tenant shopkeepers here are speaking in support of raising minimum wage at a rally organized by part-time workers union, Arba Nojo in Korea. And uh, this uh, picture is just one example of many of these practices. So with this, uh, you can ask the question, why are certain tenant shopkeepers organizing with the low paid precarious workers? Uh, it, it is a question of whether they are uh, in a way organizing against are they organizing against their self-interest as small entrepreneurs? And it is also, it gets to the question of, oops, how can we make sense of the class politics of tenant shopkeepers in, in Seoul? So to answer this question, I, I look into the existing literature. So the Marxist, classic Marxist literature uh, will, classify these tenant shopkeepers as buddhi bourgeoisies. And, uh, the, and by doing so, they dismissively label these tenant shopkeepers as unrevolutionary, reactionary, and inherently individualistic. Of course, as I am just showing you that uh, this is not always the case. And uh, even so, uh, the, this category of buddhi bourgeoisies is analytically unsatisfying. It is too broad uh, in order to understand really the class politics of tenant shopkeepers. So then I turn to the informal workers literature. So this literature in my view gets us a little bit closer to understanding the class politics of tenant shopkeepers. Uh, there are similarities between tenant shopkeepers and the informal workers, those who do not have a fixed employer or a legally recognized employer. And uh, the informal workers literature has very much shown uh, to us that the capitalist exploitation does not always happen in the employment relation. It doesn't, doesn't always happen within the axis of employer and employee. So uh, this awareness has particularly been raised by scholars who study the organizing of informal workers. And uh, a lot of these organizing are happening in the global south. And specifically, there are independent waste pickers, uh, day laborers, street vendors and home-based workers that have been uh, conduct this, conducting this mass organizing. However, uh, even in this literature, uh, the expropriation that happens within the relationship of real estate property relation is largely absent in the analysis. So uh, the, the relation between those who own real estate property and those who do not uh, is not uh, featured in this literature. Now, of course, uh, the literature, the obvious literature to look into might be the gentrification literature, right? So this literature specifically talks about uh, the land politics, the real estate, real estate politics. And of course, it deals about the issue of eviction. So however, when it comes to not your typical working class, which the tenant shopkeepers are, what I find is that the gentrification literature largely lumps this group uh, into the category of gentrifiers. Uh, and I can talk a little bit more in the Q&A perhaps 
of why I think this is the case. Uh, shortly saying, I think the gentrification literature is still largely coupled with the experience of the Western cities. And therefore, uh, uh, I see this miss, what I see as misclassification occurring. But uh, without going further into that, the result of that is uh, tenant shopkeepers evictions and their potential agency to resist those evictions are largely obscured, even within uh, the gentrification literature. Yet what we are seeing is tenant shopkeepers are saying that uh, uh, organizing against their exclusion and then they are demanding that we should pay attention to the value they create through their work and that their livelihoods matter. So with this in mind, my research tries to bring in these voices and by doing so contribute uh, to the literature on class politics and uh, inequality by demonstrating how increasingly important it is to understand the speculative city. And uh, speculative, uh, I use this term slightly different from the literature on speculative urbanism. So let me define how I use speculative city. Speculative city, I mean cities where urban real estate is increasingly captured as a speculative commodity that is expected, anticipated to yield high returns. So this speculation on urban real estate is uh, showing us manifesting as a problem, as a source of problem, uh, disrupting the livelihoods of tenant shopkeepers. And we see uh, numerous news uh, coming from Korea saying that these tenant shopkeepers are putting in extremely long working hours, but barely making their ends meet. So, uh, but, but even more importantly, tenant shopkeepers are finding that their own value being degraded through rent hikes and evictions that accompany the speculative turn of the city. And I highlight that the, we are only becoming to be aware of the precarity of tenant shopkeepers only because they are starting to make noise and organize. Now, uh, with that, in the remaining time, I will provide some context of my uh, who these tenant shopkeepers are. I'll go into my case, what I am studying and how I am studying them, my methods. And then I will I'll go into the findings of what deri drives and shapes the tenant shopkeepers class politics. And uh, in doing so, I will highlight three aspects three factors that are playing a key role. Uh, one is how the tenant shopkeepers are framing their struggle as their sweat equity being expropriated by the landlords. Second, how they are doing so by practicing this tactic of occupying livelihood spaces. And third, how they are forming a uh, solidarity with the city's social movement actors. And then I'll go to go on to summarize my analysis and then wrap up by uh, talking a little bit about my contribution in terms of reconceptualizing class politics and inequality. So uh, first let's, I will go into the context. So there is not uh, aggregated data uh, on tenant shopkeepers, but there is on the self-employed. And uh, just shift the gaze outside of the global north, what we find is that the self-employed constitutes a large proportion of the global workforce. So especially among the world low income, it is uh, 50%, you see here. And among the so-called newly industrialized countries, like countries like these, you see that uh, self-employment has continued to uh, constitute a large proportion of the workforce. Now, zooming into Korea specifically, what we find is one out of four workers, the economically active population is actually self-employed. So uh, 
self-employment in Korea makes on average uh, only 60% of the wage workers average income. And uh, when we look into the low skilled and low educated population, uh, uh, you see a lot of movement between these two categories of self-employment and low income wage work. Also, a lot of retirees are taking on self-employment. <clears throat> Those who do not have, cannot afford to stop working after being retired are taking on self-employment as a backup a livelihood strategy. Now, uh, my research draws from 15 months of ethnographic field work with uh, the social movement organization of tenant shopkeepers called people who want to run a commercial business with peace of mind. Abbreviated as Mamsangmo in Korean. This organization spread rapidly since its inception, inception in 2013. Uh, and they did so by uniting these scattered shops that are really all around the metropolitan area of Seoul. So these red dots, what you're seeing here is uh, the conflict zones that I spent a lot of time doing field work. Uh, I spent a lot of time actually defending uh, the shops in, in the shops in many of these places. And you get the sense of the scattered nature of uh, this conflict of this issue. Uh, a part, as part of my participatory research, uh, I spent a lot of time again defending these uh, shops with the tenant shopkeepers collectively. And so some of my da daily activities consist of uh, pulling in night shift uh, in these shops uh, who have the fear that the eviction squads might uh, raid early in the morning and also uh, organizing cultural events within these shops. So uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the background of the social movement fear field that constitutes the evictees movement in South Korea. So prior to Mam Sang Mo, the shops that were facing rent hikes and displacement pressure from their landlords didn't have much in terms of representation. Uh, there, uh, you might know that there are uh, older evictee organizations in Korea. Uh, you might be more familiar with organizations like Cheonchol Hyop or Cheonchol Yeon. But these organizations concentrate on evictees that are generated from large scale redevelopments. So it is executed under the name of urban planning and all uh, public good projects. On the other hand, Mam Sang Mo is the only group that are organizing tenant shopkeepers who are struggling against vis a vis individual landlords. So that's, uh, that was my ethnographic portion of my data collection. And on top of that, I also did a lot of archival research. I did life history interviews with uh, Mam Sang Mo tenant shopkeepers as well as activists. And I also interviewed a lot of the key players who <coughs> involved in my story. Now, uh, I will go, let me go over some of my main findings. So uh, I find that Mam Sang Mo is conceptualizing that with eviction and with rent hike, What's happening is landlords are expropriating the sweat equity of tenant shopkeepers. So sweat equity, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, means uh, the hard work that someone does to build or improve a business project or product that helps to increase its value. So let me walk you through uh, what Mam Sang Mo means by tenant shopkeepers sweat equity being expropriated. So the illustration that you are seeing here, there is two women tenant shopkeepers. They opened this coffee place in the outskirt of Seoul in a, a quiet residential neighborhood. 
And uh, what they were able to do was increase the value of this property, of this commercial property, by basically making it all popular. So uh, it become this neighborhood gathering spot. And since this coffee place kind of took off, there was many similar coffee shops that began to open in the neighborhood that also roast their own coffee bean. Something that I was told that these two women all had pioneered in, in this neighborhood. And then the landlord of this uh, property sees this and sees opportunity to cash in on the success. So the landlord says uh, he's, he claims that he's going to use this property for himself and ask the tenants to leave. The tenant shopkeepers decide that this is unjust and then and they're going to resist uh, this eviction unless the landlord offers them uh, a reasonable compensation. So the tenants uh, actually fiercely resist their evictions and they do so with uh, their customers slash neighbors. And uh, there is even a documentary if you uh, neighbor Gapeku, uh, you will see a documentary made out of this resistance. And uh, these two women uh, later on go on to become the founding members of Mamsangmo. Now, who are, one might ask, uh, the building owners that enter into such antagonistic relationship with the tenant shopkeepers? So in Korea, urban real estate has a long history of being captured as a speculative commodity. You can easily spot banners like this in the streets of Seoul. Uh, it says, Tabak Tabak Gorse Padum Yok Haiza. They're promoting that you can live comfortably off monthly rental income. And in the bookshelves of major bookstores, you will see many best selling books like this. Uh, here uh, it's saying uh, that basically sells the idea that. Being a wage worker, Wargupzengi, is not enough. Your corporation is not going to take responsibility for you in your old age. You have to think of a side gig. And that to them is uh, investing in real estate. So it's, this book is on uh, the real estate investment know-how of a wage worker who became a 6.3 millionaire. And uh, one thing to notice is that commercial property in the last decade surfaced as this prime investment commodity. And this is partially owing to the high uh, rental income to price ratio of commercial buildings compared to residential buildings. And uh, many, you see many investors are actually taking out large loans uh, with the calculation that they can finance their interest payments by squeezing, further squeezing their tenant shopkeepers. Uh, in all this backdrop of real estate investment frenzy, the idea that the hard work, the sweat equity of tenant shopkeepers are being expropriated, uh, you can find this in the language used by Mam Sangmo. So, uh, I, I will read from this poster, especially among the activists of Mam Sangmo, you hear them saying things like, oh, how can you justify the exploitation of people's labor in the name of property rights? So you see that they are very much using the language of labor uh, in understanding their struggles. And this idea of their labor being expropriated or exploited is then translated into uh, demands for legislative change. So some of examples are demands for stricter commercial rent control and demands that tenant shopkeepers have a right to secure a compensation for the contribution they made to increase the value of its landlord's property when they're being evicted. So again, the idea is the coffee place tenants, the two women, 
have inputted their labor power to increase the value of the commercial property. And so they should have some say over that added value. They should have some right. And uh, this compensation will then be used for these tenants to uh, move and restart somewhere else within the city. Of course, uh, to some, these demands uh, are large, they largely fall short. Uh, so for some allies who joined the struggle of Mam Sangmo with a more revolutionary vision, feel like uh, the demands for compensation is uh, far from enough, far from uh, going critically against the capitalist system. But uh, I see Mam Sangmo's demands as being both uh, in a way modest and radical and radical in a sense that it directly goes up against the entrenched power structure, against the very powerful landed class. It directly tackles the profit of the landed class. And uh, in both measures on these both demands, Mam Sang Mo was able to make considerable gains in terms of changing the legal structure. Now, I want to demonstrate to you how the class politics of tenant shopkeepers is, uh, is being made and formed through the process of occupying livelihood spaces. So uh, the crystallization of Mam Sang Mo's right claims, the claims that profits should not be made at the expense of livelihood very much emerges out of uh, the struggles in these spaces. So uh, in practice, what this means is the tenant shopkeepers are occupying their shops to defend it. They are putting their bodies in between the shop and uh, the eviction squad, Chargo Yongnyok, uh, to defend their livelihoods. And uh, Mam Sang Mo, by doing so, transforms these mundane spaces of commerce into uh, political spaces of resistance. Uh, of course, the immediate goal of uh, conducting such direct action is to gain bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the landlords. However, uh, I show that by going through this process, uh, this struggle pushes uh, the Mam Sang Mo beyond this immediate uh, individual goal and gain. First of all, when Mam Sang Mo's occupation is met with violent repression and uh, the people wearing the black hat are the eviction squads who came to raid the store, uh, this kind of violent confrontation uh, stirs raw emotions. So I interviewed some of the tenant shopkeepers who uh, spoke to me about their shock, uh, about their feelings, uh, uh, from these, uh, by confronting these eviction struggles. And they explained this to me by uh, talking about certain scenes that stuck to them. So one tenant shopkeeper told me that uh, those tables that I wiped every morning ruined and thrown outside. Another said, I will never forget the sight of my raw chicken splattered on the concrete floor. So forced eviction is uh, in many ways a coercive erasure of everyday uh, livelihood spaces, the spaces that tenant shopkeepers have put so much time and en energy into. And therefore these direct confrontation with the landed class uh, helps Mam Sang Mo clarify and articulate uh, the relational aspect of power that the profit of the property owner is directly inherently related to the dwindling life chances of tenant shopkeepers. And I stress this because not all policy proposals that are being made have this aspect of relational understanding of power. 
In fact, if you read many of the policy proposals that are being made, uh, they do not dare touch the property owner's right to profit, right? So unless you are willing to accept, uh, upset a powerful voting block, uh, you do not talk about uh, disrupting or challenging the right to profit. So a lot of the policies that are proposed, although in good intention, end up being measures uh, to only placate the tenant shopkeeper's uh, grievance uh, rather than tackling directly the source of the problem. Uh, for Mam Sangmo, on the other hand, occupying livelihood spaces and the confrontation that takes place within these spaces serve as this kind of constant reminder that uh, the, in order to fix the problem, you need to go to the source of the problem. And so Mam Sangmo has been pushing for more fundamental uh, changes that will shift the uneven power between the landed class and the tenant shopkeepers. Now, uh, I also found through field work that occupying livelihood spaces, if it is to work at all, it cannot stop at the moments of drama, moments of confrontation and spectacles of violence. It has to continue beyond those all times and it has to be embedded in the everyday lives of the participants. So to this end, what Mam Sangmo does is they opens up, they open up their shops uh, as a place of gathering during these peaceful intervals uh, to the wider public. So uh, what you're seeing here is inside of one Mam Sangmo's tenant shopkeeper shop. Uh, that is resisting it, its eviction, they, they are hosting these cultural events. So here, some of the indie artists in Korea has volunteered to perform. And of course, this event is then advertised in social media to attract uh, like-minded people. And once uh, those gather like this, uh, what happens is that uh, this space offers them this unique opportunity to experience the struggle, hear directly from the, the tenant shopkeeper why they are resisting their eviction and uh, what the issue is. And so it very much creates this space of empathy. So uh, during my field work, uh, I attended many of these cultural events that take place in these uh, shops of Mam Sangmo and uh, in the form of public lecture, poetry reading, uh, theater, Catholic mass, and so on. The last point I want to emphasize is how these practices of occupying spaces then functions as nodes and conduits to connect the tenant shopkeepers to uh, the city's social movement actor. So Seoul, like many large cities, contain a sizable network of progressives, progressives who are open-minded, socially conscious, and willing to take on direct actions, those who have an appetite for direct actions. And uh, by plugging Mam Sangmo's shops into this network, what happens is Mam Sangmo's tenant shopkeepers uh, get their first exposure to this so-called progressive culture. All right, so this progressive culture uh, might be something that is very prevalent among the younger generations, but for many of the Mam Sangmo tenant shopkeepers, and especially among them, those who are in the lower rung of class and educational background, this is something that they rarely encountered in their everyday lives. So it offers this unique opportunity. And this shows in uh, the interviews I, I did with the tenant shopkeepers when, we, when they talk about how they changed by uh, interactions in these spaces. So tenant shopkeepers will say, tell me that they used to, when they see street posts, protest, they used to think of it as 
purely negatively. It is bad for business. It's bad for the economy. And they talk about how that thought has changed over time uh, by meeting these other social groups, progressive groups. And let me explain to you what's going on in this picture a little, little bit. So this is a tent that is erected in front of what used to be a pig intestine restaurant. The pig intestine restaurant tenant is has decided that he will continue to resist his eviction even after being evicted. And in this site, uh, nearby university students have started to gather. So these are students from the Methodist Theological University, actually. And uh, this day when I was there, uh, there was this activity that I participated. We formed small circles uh, and there would be a leader, student leader, who is leading prayers. And then we would go around, introduce ourselves, we'll, we'll talk about our personal concerns, issues, and then uh, talk about, you know, what's going on in this side, what do we think about it, and so forth. So it's very much this intimate setting. And what you see is through these face-to-face -face interactions, a new solidarity, a new foundation for solidarity is emerging. So uh, this is manifested by a conversation I had with one female uh, tenant shopkeeper who she is in her 60s. So she told me about the time when she finally gathered her courage to tell her adult son that she is involved with Mam Tangwo. And her adult son, upon hearing this, he ran to his mom's shop. He, he, he heard that she's involved with this militant radical group, right? So he ran to her shop only to find all these strangers in her shops. So he says to his mom, mother, who are all these people? And the tenant shopkeeper told me how she felt very vindicated by all the support she is getting in her shop. And uh, to answer this question, who are all these people, maybe it will be illuminating to give you a sort of a snapshot of the possible diverse people that you can encounter in Mam Sangmo sites. So the part-time workers union that I mentioned earlier in this presentation uh, were uh, uh, frequent participants of Mam Sangmo sites. And some of these part-time worker union members were also affiliated at the time with the Labor Party. And uh, as for the Labor Party, way before the formal leadership of the Labor Party, uh, forged a relationship, formal relationship with Mam Sangmo, the younger members of the Labour Party started showing up in Mam Sangmo's site. They held their study groups and uh, book clubs within these spaces. So they were very much uh, uh, active members. And then in some places, the local co-op movement, uh, people from the co-op movement had a large presence also the Progressive Neighborhood Association people as well. And some of the sites had a large number of artists, artists who have experienced their, their share of being evicted from spaces that they made popular to the larger public. So they understood this issue. And so a lot of the artists had also a presence. And this list really goes on. And so, uh, what I can say is the mix of people who are joining the struggle of Mam Sangmo in each site is always changing. Each site has their own uh, followers and their own characteristics uh, in many ways, depending on where the site is located in many cases. And there are, of course, ebbs and flows of the overall size of the allies and also the Mam Sangmo members that are participating in any given site. But one thing that is constant is that Mam Sangmo came to rely on the solidarity uh, of social movement actors and their members in order to defend their stores. 
And in return, what I see is that the class politics of the tenant shopkeepers are very much shaped through these relationships that they encounter within these spaces. So now let me summarize my analysis. Mamsung Mo coalesces their members by starting to conceptualize uh, that rent hikes and evictions uh, by landlords are uh, tenant shopkeepers, sweat equity being expropriated. Of course, the collective identity around this expropriation did not come out of thin air. The socioeconomic context of the struggle, which is the rampant real estate investment in Korea, uh, makes creates this condition where the struggle and this language of expropriation uh, is able to resonate with the larger public. But what is equally important that I find is that simultaneously there is this practice of occupying livelihood spaces so the direct confrontation that happens within these spaces with the landlords help articulate the antagonistic interests that tenant shopkeepers enter with the landlords also all tenant shopkeepers solidarity with the city movement actors are developed one, through figuring out the messaging that resonates with the social movement actors. And second, by employing occupying tactics that provide a venue for social movement actors to participate in the struggle. And the so solidarity that is created as a result in return is also further honed all further hone the messaging and shapes the collective identity of tenant shopkeepers. So uh, in short, what I'm trying to say is that the class politics of tenant shopkeepers, uh, them seeing themselves as part of the working class, or in, in Korean terms, we might call uh, them, them seeing themselves as part of the ul, as opposed to the ka, yonde. It's very much emerging through these interactive processes. The tenant shopkeepers might initiate relationship with other social movement actors out of need to defend their shops. But what happens along the way is that it transforms the tenant shopkeepers themselves, their language change and who they see as their allies, who, who their interest aligns with change through these processes. So uh, what we can say is any alliance can start with a very calculative motivation, but grow into a solidaristic, solidarity-based relationship. I will lastly talk about the contribution of my work. So I draw largely from the Korean studies literature that is already doing a lot of the analytical and intellectual work of bringing in the urban real estate speculation story into the analysis of inequality and class. And these are some of the uh, core troops and works that are under this uh, literature. But my work uh, takes the vantage point from the social movements. And uh, by doing so, I examine how these seemingly formidable structures of inequalities are uh, not as invincible as some of the scholars make us uh, lead to believe. And uh, this point is related to how I see my work contributing to the broader urban studies as well as gentrification studies and uh, how it contributes the politics of class and solidarity. So my work unravels the black box of how to create solidarity, one that is able to weave together very disparate groups and thereby forge this credible challenge to the very powerful actors, the landed class. And the kind of struggle, the resist kind of challenge that leads to actual legislative change, but not only that, but changes the minds of people or, or how the rights to the city should be distributed. 
And I argue that class politics and even class example, the interest, class interest of the tenant shopkeepers is not something that is fixed, but is very much shaped through the interaction with the speculative city and also uh, with the practices within the speculative city. So uh, as speculation on urban real estates are intensifying all throughout uh, this urbanizing world, I see uh, there is much to gain from analyzing and really evaluating uh, how these tenant shopkeepers are trying to forge this this uh, different path to create a more just city. Okay, uh, that is it for my presentation. Thank you everyone for listening and I look forward to your questions and all uh, feedbacks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, let me just say um, that was a terrific talk. I mean, really impressive talk because um, I'm listening to you and thinking about how you're sort of checking all the boxes. You're de you've got great detail, but you're you're not forgetting you know the theory and the big general picture. You're you're providing all of this evidence, and yet you are also showing how you're intervening in a certain body of literature. And I was kind of reminded when you were you were talking about um, you know how. Uh, important Nancy Abelman's 1996 book on social movements of tenant farmers mm. uh, was in showing just how important really good ethnographic research is in studying um, social and economic change in South Korea. And you've really done that. I mean, wow, was she alive today? You know, this is like her legacy uh, of people doing such excellent ethnographic work. So really great. Great job. Um, and um, I would like to open the uh, floor up to questions. Um, under, in the bottom banner, you can, um, uh, oh, somebody's saying that my camera needs to be changed, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, under the banner on the bottom, you can raise your hand with the reactions tab, or you can um, ask a question by typing it in. If you raise your hand, then I'll call on you. You can unmute yourself and then you can ask Dr. Lee the question yourself. So I guess I will, will open it up to, to questions for you. Yeah, one, I wanna echo Richard in saying um, excellent talk. It was really interesting. So I have two questions. The first is quite narrowly about the eviction squads that you mentioned. Um, who are they? Who's sending them? Um, I've encountered them a little bit in my research about Hansen's disease uh, villages, resettlement villages in Korea. And I'm, I've always been curious about um, that category. And the second question is um, more broadly, are, do you have the sense that um, Mam Sang Mo and groups like this are targeting the state? Are they targeting local governments or they're primarily targeting the landowners? And so it, who, who is the other that they're mobilizing against? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, that's a very good question uh, that I wish I spent more time in my, in my uh, presentation. So yes, the eviction squads, it's uh, super important to understand who these eviction squads are. Uh, if we go back in history, of course, uh, into the developmental state, era in the 1980s when the evictee struggle was at its peak. Some people might argue these eviction squads were not formalized, so they were very much neighborhood thugs, right? Now they are a formal entity and the landlords hire them under the law of uh, uh, execution law in South Korea. And so they're private, privately hired by the landlords a lot of them are uh, more going into more spe specifically who they are, are actually college students who are in uh, sports majors, right? So a lot of them are uh, uh, quite young. And uh, uh, if, 
there are people, uh, researchers who've interviewed these eviction squads, and some of them are very conflicted with their role because their parents uh, might have been tenant shopkeepers and so forth. And tenant shopkeepers are someone that is very close in your life, right? So these eviction squads are very interesting, but uh, they are the mercenaries that are used to uh, uh, repress struggles against uh, eviction. And so, and as for the target of these uh, evictee struggles, I think this is a very interesting distinction to make between uh, the struggles, uh, evictee struggles that Chon Chorion and Chon Chorion was very much involved in in the 80s to the Mam Sangmo struggle. Because in the 80s, uh, when this evictee struggles were largely uh, under the umbrella of Minjung movement, uh, these people were like the Minjung, they were uh, influenced by the Minjung movement, specifically the students who also came to the evictee sites and joined in the struggle. And so the, the main target became the, the Tebal state alliance that that complex right so uh, they they it, it, the very much if you look at the language created at those times you would read that uh, these people are seeing that these corporate uh chaebol and the state is destroying the livelihoods of everyday people of minjung so you see the clear uh, antagonism against the state and the and the market uh, now, moving into the current more era after the 1910s, uh, what you see is that the landed class that was very much created during the 1980s, right? The, in order to create that apartment commodity as a key investment commodity, they not only had to enlist the chaebol, uh, to to build the housing, the apartments, but they had to create consumers. And uh, scholars like Myung Ji Yang would say that the new middle class was created through uh, those who invested and was able to secure uh, this, this housing stock and make money well through these housing, right? So these new middle class and really the desire to bandwagon in this kind of wealth uh, accumulation. And so the rented class or those aspiring rentier class are become the new target and uh, they are now more consolidated. They are powerful actors and uh, uh, their, their investment not only goes into real estate, but uh, young scholars are now reading how they are investing in other realms as well, like Bitcoins and so on. But this this rentier class is very much an uh, 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 object of one envy, but also resentment, right? Resentment, and this is captured in Korea in the word pulosodok, soduk, uh, the income that is created without work, without labor, right? So uh, uh, the rentier class who is benefiting from the pulosodok becomes the, the key antagonist, the, the key. Uh, uh, arch nemesis in, in this story. We now have a question from Jonathan uh, Chiarella and uh, then Douglas Gabriel is on deck. Um, although I also uh, think that uh, Donald Kirk, are you wanting to get in line? Uh, were you raising your hand? Give me a thumbs up if, if you were. Okay, so we've got Jonathan Chiarella, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and then Douglas Gabriel, and then Donald Kirk. Go ahead, um, Jonathan. Uh, yes, hello, thank you for your uh, talk. It's, uh, it was quite, an, I, th I think it's been quite enlightening to look at the uh, Asian example, as you have here with uh, how these uh, tenant shopkeepers are not behaved in that classical sense of, oh, well, they're going to be reactionary. I, I was also reminded of a, uh, of a Korean book, Ganane Shide by Choi Yin Gi, mm. about the uh, street vendors. And that, you know, su surprised me to some extent. But then I thought, well, from having, you know, lived in Korea, 
I see that a lot of these people, they're quote small business owners, but they're working like 70 hour work weeks and it's just them and their families. Uh, and I know at the end of your, uh, your slides, you had a lot of literature there and I'm not in sociology, so I don't know as much as those, but um, at least I can say from the outside that uh, there have not been those inroads into general social science. A lot of times class is taken for granted as just income based or something very, very, very simplistic like that. And I'm wondering how you see the example of Korea, how scholars can like yourself and others can make this literature really get out there to the West and to general literature and make the inroads because the only big example I can think of from the West has been Eric Owen Wright's class counts, which showed that for example, in Japan, the, uh, the the people who have like you know small business owners would socialize with uh, low skilled low paid workers and then highly skilled but low on the run workers would be very social with their bosses and they were in a completely different social sphere which which conflicted with you know a lot with what a lot of people would assume so I see like you know there are a lot of great examples that we can use here to help upend a lot of our assumptions but I don't unfortunately I just I don't see it getting there so I'm wondering what the next step forward is for the greater literature thank you. Thank you. That is a big question. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, Che Ingi, who wrote Kanane Shide, uh, the era of poverty, will very much appreciate that uh, he mentioned uh, your, his work because he complained to me that all these scholars uh, take their work without referencing himself or uh, him. So uh, I make sure to reference the non-scholars uh, when I try to, uh, when I write my book. So uh, yes, uh, one, one literature that comes to mind is the literature on precariats. And I think uh, there has been efforts by uh, talking about the precariats, uh, uh, this kind of new kind of class emerging. And uh, Eric Allenwright that you also mentioned has a great piece uh, that talks about is Precariat a class. I think that's the title of the art article. And he is very critical of the precariat literature in this piece. And he says it, it, it doesn't talk about how these various elements, various groups will somehow get together and see their collective interest and able to uh, crystallize a shared, a language of shared interest. This uh, vast literature of precariat uh, spearheaded by Guy Standing that is very popular among labor scholars uh, sort of misses the point of how to get to that end point of precariat. And so uh, I see my work as sort of trying to lay that bridge how and through what kind of mechanism and really like what are the specific actors that will start seeing or start in uh, certain moments aligning with other interests, uh, part-time workers, Arba uh, Nojo with, with uh, tenant shopkeepers were one example. Another example that comes to mind right now is the platform workers, the delivery workers that are uh, in Korea right now. They are trying to fight against the merger of the two big platform companies. And of course, uh, this merger, this monopoly that will be created as a result is bad for the platform workers, but it's also bad for the tenant shopkeepers who have to pay probably a larger fee to these platform companies. So again, uh, in these moments, and of course it's related to the COVID-19 uh, crisis and how these workers are all uh, frontline workers, it is sort of exposing uh, the, the mon monopoly. It is also revealing ways to connect different uh, workers that may not initially see uh, their interest as aligning. So yes, uh, for me, the project is al always to uh, sort of reconnect the dots to see how this uh, class, new kind of class politics, uh, whether that is cr uh, called precariats or ureyonde, uh, I don't know, but uh, how to get to that point and how we can sort of uh, rediscover the initiatives that on the ground that are being made. Our next question comes from Douglas Gabriel. Yep, hi, Gabriel. Uh, let me start my screen here. Um, yeah, so this question is, um, 
about the concept of sweat equity. Um, so as I understand it, as you're, you're explaining, uh, it really hinges on the idea that um, a particular area uh, is, is gaining popularity through, through the labor of uh, the shopkeepers. And, and I can see that really easily in the example of the coffee shop. But I was wondering how this concept um, or just if it comes into play in a case like um, the area of Cheonggyecheon uh, right now that's undergoing uh, so many evictions and in which it's primarily manufacturing shops and you get the sense that there's an enormous amount of sweat uh, there, but mm -hmm. I don't think they have that much interest in like popularizing the area. Mm -hmm. You know, you step off the, the train at Ulturo and you feel like you um, entered the 1950s, you know, seeing these shop owners who have owned the, the places since the Korean War, like cutting sheet metal with, on, the, on the sidewalk and sparks flying everywhere and such. So is, is this, does sweat equity come into play here or is that only in um, cases in which, um, you know, a, a particular marketing strategy or, or uh, you know, like you explained with the coffee shop example uh, works, so thanks. I think uh, this is a very critical point that could get into the division within Mamsangmo, right? So I'm, I'm very glad you bring up this point. And uh, within Mamsangmo, what I wasn't able to fully tease out in the presentation is there is quite a broad range in terms of uh, class background. So some of these people, uh, uh, I think quite funnily will be described as uh, the typical gentrifi gentrifiers in the Western context. Some of these are yoga studios, you know, espresso coffee shops. These are all what in the Western context will be described as gentrifiers, right? But as long as they're tenant shopkeepers in the Korean context, they are mobilizing together. But of course, there is a lot of noise within this mobilization, and you kind of got to the very core of that noise, which is some tenant shopkeepers, and some of them are uh, specifically have more cultural and social capital. Some of them are uh, highly educated, did degrees in foreign countries, and came back and opened the art cafe, right? They are also facing evictions. And they, some of them are trying to use this specific language that they are all, all cultural promoters. They are art creators and all, you know, place makers and so forth. And this will create a tension with the more mom and pop workers, mom and pop shopkeepers all, who are not really doing the art cultural creation of a place, right? And I think uh, Cheonggyecheon uh, shopkeepers are the same story. So uh, Mam Sang Mo had, long, had to long from the very beginning of its inception, if it had to uh, try to uh, bring up a language that will encompass these various elements within its group. And the result was sweat equity. And I agree that it's not always that satisfactory, but it, it is an attempt to acknowledge the labor as opposed to uh, sort of the cultural placemaking value. And, uh, uh, you know, what, what we find, I guess, as ethnographers is the kind of the demands that are made by, by a certain group is not rationally the best path uh, to, to the end, but it is the path that has been uh, rallying people. It is the path that people get excited and mobilize against it. And that is all uh, the compensation. That is the colleague behind all uh, this. So it, it becomes this rallying point. And so I think it's a different question whether that is the most ideal uh, policy suggestion that you would make as an outsider or what is the most viable path to uh, rally people. So uh, that's that's kind of uh, where, how I see that issue. And yes, uh, my, my article on critical sociology, I specifically try to sort of deal with these tensions and talk about how they end up uh, 
not choosing the path where it would exclude a lot of low income uh, mom and pop tenant shopkeepers, but stick with a language that has a possibility to encompass a larger group of tenant shopkeepers. Thank you. Our next question comes from Donald uh, Kirk. And then um, after Donald Kirk, um, we'll go to uh, Yu Jong Oh and Hengjin Park. Uh, President Moon, in his New Year's address, made a big issue out of the rising price of uh, real estate and, and of homes and rental home rentals and so forth. I, I, I may have missed something, but I don't know that you've addressed the policies of the central government and how much it's affecting uh, the issues that you're raising. And also, uh, uh, what about the policies of the mayor of Seoul, the acting mayor, I should point out, the late former mayor, Park Won Soon, was quite sympathetic with some of these issues. And beyond all this, uh, can you go a little beyond Seoul? Uh, how much does all this uh, issue affect the rest of Korea? Uh, you know, Seoul's 10 million people, uh, the northern area, Incheon, Seoul, Gyeonggi province is 25 million, but then there's Busan and a lot of other cities, uh, Gwangju, et cetera. So how much are they affected uh, or hurt or, or in controversy and turmoil because of this basic issue that you've raised. So I've kind of asked about three questions at one time, but I'd really appreciate your response. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's an excellent question. And it is an issue of uh, how the different political structure might create opportunities might become allies of this movement or not. And what I could say in sort of this broad, broad stroke matter is that whether it was the government of the right-leaning government of Lee Myung-bak or the left-leaning government of No Muyeon, No Muyeon specifically came in uh, saying that he's going to tackle this issue of real estate. And I think the assessment has been that he has failed. And so this is an issue that is incredibly sensitive. The real estate and sort of reigning in the real estate interest is a, a, a big issue in terms of uh, voting politics. Some people might say the uh, you can create a map of Korea in terms of real estate prices, and that will uh, align with how these people voted within also uh, election, for example. And I've seen these maps. And uh, 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 to say a little bit about the uh, the belated mayor, uh, Park Won Soon, Seoul mayor, and uh, this it was the time when I was in I was doing field work. And there are uh, many tensions between the bureaucrats and the policy wants and the policy experts and the policies that they propose with all good intentions. And Park Won Soon was very much in favor of creating this human face of the city. But I would again say that uh, one soul does not have uh, the power uh, to uh, it, it has to play within the current legislative system. So what they were able to do was limited by the law, one. But second, again, uh, because of that uh, limited control that the, the Seoul mayor has, what he was able to do is changi uh, ansimsanga. This is uh, the stores that are created for tenant shopkeepers, so they can rent it for a long period of time without being without the fear of getting evicted, and uh, uh, there's a uh, strict rent control. So he uh, proposed some of these measures, which is very much uh, in a way, uh, it's a piecemeal measure because it is not directly going after uh, the profit, and there is only so many changi and simsanga that. The mayor can create. So it placates some of the grievance and it benefits some of the tenant shopkeepers, but it falls far short in terms of the magnitude of the problem and how this could be that tackled. So uh, within the more progressive Seoul city mayors and the government, there was this, I, I say always, all uh, tension and collaborative relationship as well. And so that's kind of like the political story behind all of this. And uh, 
one thing I would say is before there was this ground organization, uh, there was uh, no movement for the, the actual law, the law that governs the commercial tenants relations uh, that was revised in 2015. There was no opportunity without the movement for this law to change. So uh, regardless of how favorable the government are, I think the important piece of the story was whether there was social movements that were really pressuring and backing uh, the radical shift to uh, uh, changing the relationship between tenant shopkeepers and the land. But a quick follow-up, how, how is President Moon doing? And, and what about the rest of Korea? So uh, yeah, that's also a great question. So President Moon, uh, so uh, again, uh, President Moon, what he is doing is uh, there is a movement within the President Moon government to recognize the tenant shopkeepers within the broader realm of workers. So for instance, uh, the recent legislative uh, change that is uh, recently has been announced is to include tenant shopkeepers, or uh, the self-employed, as well as uh, the special, specially employed uh, uh, workers who are gig workers, uh, platform workers, uh, are part of this tuxugoyongnang, and including them into the fold of workers in a way that they could uh, require or uh, ask for workers' compensation. So, including them in the worker in a sense that they can also apply for uh, insurance in terms of accidents that happens within the workplace. So, there is very much because of uh, the the organizing and the kind of the uh, visibility of tenant shopkeepers in Korea. I think in terms of COVID-19 relief fund and all these measures, the tenant shopkeepers were able to uh, actually uh, have a considerable gain. Also, uh, the canceling of debt is being uh, discussed right now. Uh, but uh, uh, at the current moment, uh, the, the discussion of real estate has seemed to sort of taken the, the backstage, is what I see. Yu jong uh, Yes. Uh, thank you, Yewon, for your fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, since you raised the question of uh, how the right to the city uh, can be distributed at the end of your talk, right? Um, I'm just wondering how you engage with the right to the city literature, which is about the contesting or challenging uh, capitalist exploitation of urban space for their accumulation, right? So they put a lot of emphasis on use value of urban space, right? Uh, by doing uh, like social and political functions, right? Uh, right to appropriation and right to participation, right? But I think your case, right, uh, actually can complicate uh, the theory, right? Because tenant shopkeepers are not entirely rejecting the capitalist accumulation, right? Rather, they are asking for a fair share of their return, right? Uh, particularly given that they have um, significantly contributed to the uh, property value increase process, right? Um, but at the same time, right, they mobilize the conventional right to the city tactics such as occupation and building solidarity, right? So um, do you have any uh, contemplation or uh, thoughts about the right to the city literature? How can you extend it? Um, or how do you compare uh, tenant shopkeepers and house tenants? given the theory. Yes, uh, uh, I've been, I think I've been for long trying to uh, evoke the right to the city literature uh, for a long time. And I've largely had, uh, I struggled with the right to the city literature to say the least. Uh, in the broad literature of resistance uh, between those who enjoy the use value and the exchange value, 
some of I see uh, if I am to map out this uh, the landscape of the literature, a lot of the literature seems to talk about public land and how people are organizing to reclaim uh, public parks, public spaces, and uh, create, introduce a more public idea of uh, using space. And uh, that has been a very uh, vibrant literature. And uh, right to the city literature, a lot of it uh, also aligns with that kind of literature. But as you are saying, all uh, the tennis shopkeeper struggles, I do see them falling you know, under the broader uh, sort of talk about how use value uh, can be valued uh, when there is tension between profit and, and those who make a livelihood through those spaces. And can't the right to the city literature uh, bring insight into the processes of how these kind of new language of rights are being claimed uh, uh, is, is a question that I would like to uh, deal with more in depth in later. But uh, yes, it, it seems like it is a, a slightly different angle than from the more prevalent uh, movement that I've seen, a lot of the movement that are tackling the, the uh, eminent domain taking of the private property by the forces of the state. And that speaks to the literature on dispossession and also how public land should can be reimagined and reclaimed that kind of literature. And tenant shopkeeper struggle are, again, as you were saying, a slightly different uh, language and slightly different in terms of what their uh, end goal is, how much of uh, anti-capitalism <coughs> excuse me, anti-capitalist ideas are they bringing in? Not much, I would say. So uh, uh, it, it has this interesting contradiction and uh, uh, not awkward fit with the right to the city in all literature. But uh, I think as you're saying, it will be interesting to delve into that kind of uh, niche of this movement more in depth. Thank you. Heng Jin Park. Hi, thank you, Yellen, for a great talk. So I, I think you mentioned it a little bit. I want to ask a little bit more about how the tenant shopkeepers and the activists are approach the quality the premium. So you mentioned about the exportation of the their sweat equity of the tenant shopkeepers, but the quality gum kind of reflects the value of their labor and their investment to their own shops. So when the shops are leased to another person, the previous tenant shopkeeper will be and they, they, can re, they can receive the, the quality so that their labor can be compensated through quality But at the same time, as the case for a lot of the tenant shopkeepers in Mamsangmo, when the landlord decided to take seize the property and use it for or their own purpose, they will not be compensated with the quality So the kind of quality is not legally protected. And so it's in, in another sense, you just kind of pass the bomb to another tenant shopkeeper by selling, I mean, moving out of the shop and giving out to another. So, so how, I wonder how the tenant shopkeepers are approaching, do, do they think the quality should be protected more legally or they, are they arguing for a totally new platform or legal kind of structure to protect their labor and their value, their work, the value of their work? Hmm. Thank you. Uh, and, uh... Quolligum is uh, uh, such a complicated law that was first a customary law, something that was very much informally <coughs> exchanged between the tenant shopkeepers. And as it became contentious, as uh, the property owners start seeing that by interrupting this relationship between tenant shopkeepers, there is money to be made. That's when this issue became contentious. And actually, our colleague was legalized in 2015, although whether all tenants can be protected of their colleague when they are leaving their shop, of course, that's not the case. There is a lot of loopholes in this law, and this is uh, a continuing fight in that way. And uh, one thing that you mentioned that I want to uh, uh, press upon is that colligum is actually an exchange between uh, the incoming tenants 
and the outgoing tenant. So the incoming tenant will have to pay this compensation to the outgoing tenant for the value that the outgoing tenant has created in, uh, in this place. And the, the specific number of the kwalugum is very much decided by the market, the, the supply and demand. And so, uh, uh, well, as you were saying, when it is, and this is also uh, one of the loopholes, when uh, the landlord says, I am now going to take over this shop and therefore there is no incoming tenant to pay you the kolligum. This has been a lot of the conflict that uh, has been surrounded around this issue. So because uh, legally then is the, is, is the landlord required to pay the compensation instead of incoming tenant. And actually there has been a Supreme Court case uh, now that the landlord indeed has to pay the kolligum, there has been one case, although it's very precarious and I see it easily being overturned. So uh, it, that is not all set in stone yet, but yes, this is a continuing, co continuing contestation over uh, what is the right, what exactly is it, and is it just, is it, uh, is it something that will actually protect tenants, shopkeepers and their livelihoods? Or is it, uh, is it going to be used in this calculative manner of uh, speculation by tenant shopkeepers is also an issue that is being raised around this. We still have time for one or two questions. And there is one question that was uh, entered earlier um, and sent to us um, by uh, Mayor, uh, Marcy Tanter. Um, at uh, Tarleton State University, uh, who writes, this issue has been raised, I assume that is evictions, this issue has been raised in several Korean dramas over the past few years. Do these plot lines help raise citizen awareness and support for the shopkeepers in any way? Uh, was, uh, Mary, Marcy Tanter, right? Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, yes, I've been, uh, also a consumer of many of these dramas that feature the struggle. And uh, sometimes they do it more uh, prominently. Sometimes it's in the sideline. Uh, I think the recent drama I saw was uh, Itaewon Class, uh, that also had the story of colleagueum and evictions and so forth. And uh, one thing, uh, of course, yes, I agree that they are raising awareness of of this issue and making it, making this very complicated concept of kolligum very approachable to the Korean public to the extent that now I think kolligum is a household name in, in, in Korea. And what, one thing I did want to add to that question was that uh, in, in many cases behind uh, these uh, uh, stories, there is actually a direct working relationship between Mam Sangmo and the cultural producers. So a lot of times when they try to uh, write a script of these dramas or webtoons or uh, newspaper stories, uh, Mam Sangmo uh, is introduced to these people through various routes. Sometimes these people would first go to a more uh, reputable organization like Chamnyo Yonde, right? Chamnyo Yonde is what, uh, participatory? People's Solidarity for Social Progress. This is like the big civil uh, social movement organization. And the Chamnyo Yonde will introduce them to Mam Sangmo. And then Mam Sangmo would be directly in consultating relationship with these country, uh, cultural producers, introducing them to tenant shopkeepers who have real testimonies to share to to show them what exactly is going on within these struggles and also inviting them again to these uh, occupation sites and have them uh, feel what the struggle is about. So a lot of, a lot of the times I had meetings with uh, webtoon writers and, and documentary uh, filmmakers in sites of Mam Sangmo and talking about uh, interviewing them in order to create these cultural productions that then, as you were saying, uh, play a role in raising awareness of this issue. We are um, out of time. Um, it's now 4.30. Uh, so yeah, I know that uh, 
we've all adapted uh, to a degree to remote presentations, but one thing that we've never, I've never seen figured out is how to do applause. Uh -huh. um, so I don't know if it means you go and put your hand. <laughs> that was a wonderful presentation and we're so delighted that you gave it and that we had such a good crowd. Uh, so a round of applause, whether it's silent or you know some sort of uh, nonverbal gesture to uh, Dr. Ye Wen Lee, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for participating. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great questions and th thank you for staying. Thank you.